Let's move on in James chapter 4, verse 13. This is a really important subject in our life and in our faith. And we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. And as we go through this, some of the things might be a little tough to hear. But I want you to listen and understand what God is saying in these passages. He says here in James chapter 4, verse 13, Go to now, ye that say, and it's kind of humorous because James here, he's kind of taunting his readers. Go to now. If you think that you're really this big, bad, and tough, let's see what you can do, is kind of what he's saying. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. And I think every one of us in our life have been there, haven't we? Uh, we love to be in control of our life. We love to be in control of what happens to us. We love to be in control, or we think we are in control of our future. And he's going to warn us here that we're really completely out of control. Have you ever thought about that? You really are out of control of your life. And he goes on here to say, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. And so today happens and you kind of, you know, manage the circumstances and the situations as they come up and you think you do a pretty good job at managing those circumstances. And if you're not careful, if we're not careful, we can begin to assume that, well, maybe I can really control things. And he's letting us know here in verse 14, we're out of control. God is in control. And that can be a real scary thought in our lives. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. We don't even know what shall be this afternoon. This afternoon, one single event could happen in a moment and your whole life change forever. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. It's interesting how frail our life is, how frail our bodies are. You know, all it takes is for your heart to stop beating or for your lungs to stop breathing. It doesn't take very much for the delicate balance of our bodies just to stop. And we begin to realize the only thing that's keeping us together is Jesus Christ. As Colossians says, he holds all things together. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I think... Uh, as you get older, you really begin to appreciate how short your life is. All you old people, don't you agree with that? You just, you know, 50 years just it comes and goes like a day. It's amazing how fast time travels. You know, and then when you start to, to hit that magic number 50 and you begin to think my life is halfway over, and then you know as, you, as the birthdays continue to go by and you start to wonder, gee, I might have 10 years left. 20 years left, and it, start, it gets real, real, real fast. And you think, wow, life is just a vapor. How short this life has been. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now what he's saying there in verse 15, he's not saying that we have to become you know, little robots or mimics, and everything we say, we have to preface it or follow it up with, well, Lord willing. It's not wrong to do that. It's definitely not bad to do that. But I want to make the point here in verse 15 that he's really looking at the heart. Is our trust in God and in God alone? Do we realize that he is in control of our life, the plans for our life, our destiny, and we really don't have control? that we think we have sometimes. You ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. <laughs> you really think you can bring something to pass. I don't care how much money you have, and I mean this, I don't care if you're Rockefeller and have all the money in the world, so to speak. I don't care how much influence or fame or status or title or reputa reputation you have. You're not bringing anything to pass that God has not foreordained. That's just the way it is. 
and you and we look sometimes and we think well what about bill gates and donald trump and you know the bilderbergers and all those people and you know what about all of them there's nothing that they're doing that god has not permitted and they can't do one thing that god forbids and so everything is under his control and that's what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of god when we talk about the sovereignty of god we're talking about his absolute authority and power over the earth. We're talking about his intimate involvement in the affairs of men's lives. We're talking about his daily, moment by moment involvement in your life and in the circumstances that you are facing. Do you know he knows every circumstance that you're facing right now? And he has taken, he has either ordained that circumstance or he has permitted that circumstance to accomplish his will and his plan in your life. And sometimes, yes, we don't like what he has ordained or permitted. But it all comes to a final good, a final conclusion, as we'll see as we look at these scriptures. He says, but now you're, you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. It is evil for you to think that you're in control of your life. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? sin. It's sin if that inner reliance and trust is not upon him. To know that God is sovereign is to walk in absolute surrender and absolute dependence. And as human beings, and especially as Americans, we don't like to hear that. We like to think that we are independent. You know, I think if we lived in, in China or in India or we were being persecuted for our lives, for our faith, maybe we would have a better appreciation of my life is in his hands. But here in America, you know, our liberties, our freedom, our prosperity has puffed up our hearts, and we think that we really are in control when we're not. And all it takes is for one event to show us just how out of control we are. And so when you begin to when you begin to really think about the sovereignty of God and how involved God is in my life, it demands that surrender and that dependence. Father, I can't take my next breath without you. The next beat of my heart depends on you. Now that can cause a myriad of reactions in us, can't it? It can, it can cause a reaction of, I resent this. Who does God think he is? I want to be in control of my life. It can cause that type of a reaction, or it can cause a great peace to come over you to realize, you know what, I don't have to worry. This is why Jesus said, take no thought, because God is in control. And whose safer hands could I be in but the hands of my Heavenly Father? He only intends good for me. I love the wisdom here in Psalms 39 as the psalmist prays, and I would really encourage you to make this your prayer today, this morning. Psalms 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end. My end. My end when I stand before you. And how much money I accumulated and the house that I lived in and my career and the title and the reputation I received means nothing. Do you realize all of those things that we stress about so much in this life will mean nothing in the end. We brought nothing in and we take nothing out. And when we stand before him, all of the accolades of the earth are meaningless. And so what really, all that matters is knowing him and being in right standing with him. Lord, make me to know my end. Make me to understand that there is nothing in this world system that is worth living for. The only thing worth living for is what is meaningful to him in my end when I stand before him. Make me to know my end. Make me to know the measure of my days. Cause me to realize that I'm not as big and bad and tough as I think I am. My life is but a vapor. I'm here today, gone tomorrow. Father, calls me to know how frail I am. Because when you understand God's sovereignty, 
you understand how dependent you are on him for everything in your life. Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath. As a hand breath. Huh. So your life is about from here to here. That's it. That's what he's saying. In light of eternity. In fact, that's probably complimentary in light of eternity. Thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is as nothing before thee. You know, I, I believe very strongly in respecting and honoring our elders and our seniors, and I believe they deserve a lot of credit and a lot of respect. And the older I get, the more convinced I am of that. But our age is as nothing before the Lord. You know, well, I've lived 60 years, and I have this wisdom and this life experience. Uh, try God. He's lived for an eternity. How much wisdom does he have? My age is as nothing before thee. Every man at his best state is altogether what? So the very best that I can pull together, if I put on my best clothes, wear my best makeup, if I gossip myself up real good, it's altogether what? It's altogether vanity. It's as nothing. And we'll see that one day when we stand before the purity and the brilliance of his glory and his light, we'll see the vanity of everything we try to put together on our own. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. Disquieted. You know how disquieted we get, how stressed out we get, worrying about this and worrying about that? and It's vain. It's vain for us to worry. Jesus said it this way, by taking thought, can you add one cubit to your stature? How many of you have tried to grow an inch lately? I'm going, to, I'm going to try to grow an inch, you know. Doesn't work, does it? It just does not work. Stretch yourself out on a rack, you're still. You, you've only got so much bone and matter there, you're not adding a cubit to your stature, and so it's just as vain to worry because God is in absolute control. They are disquieted in vain. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, I put there in your notes, one of the great biblical tensions of walking by faith is the absolute sovereignty of God in every life and every circumstance versus man's free will, including the consequences of our choices and actions. And you know, all through the Bible, you have different tensions like this. You know, you have the tension of, uh, we are saved by faith. We are saved by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We're not saved by works, right? That's one truth. And then we have the other truth, faith without works is dead. And so that, that's a tension. And as we've talked about before, the Bible and our walk of faith is full of tensions like that. And it's a good tension. Every time you move... The, Fluid movement is accomplished in your body by one muscle contracting while another muscle is expanding simultaneously. And so one is pushing, one is pulling. And because of that, you can move your legs and your arms and it's fluid motion. But without that push-pull, without the tension, without opposing forces, you can't stand upright. It's called balance. And in scriptures you have that tension of balance continually. We're not saved by works, but yet faith without works is dead. There's tension there. There's another great tension in the Bible. That is this, that God is in control of my life and every circumstance of my life, yet I have free will. And you have to embrace both. If you're going to be a Christian who believes the Bible, you have to believe that God predestinates and preordains my life, yet simultaneously I have my free will. How does that work? I don't know. It's like explaining how can God be one, yet three at the same time. It's, we just have to come to the, the fact of the matter. We can't explain or understand or rationalize the Bible. 
if we could, it would completely take the supernatural out of the Bible. And we don't want to do that. God is supernatural. God is bigger than our puny little brains. He is infinite in wisdom. His ways are incomprehensible. We will never figure him out. And thank God that we can't. And so there are certain truths that we accept by faith without having to explain them. And so we have this tension here of my life is ordered by God, yet I have free will and I do receive the consequences of my choices. And I do reap what I sow. So how does that work? Well, Psalms 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And this is, this is, you know, kind of the hallmark verse when you talk about the sovereignty of God. By the way, I put the word, word, word good in brackets there because good is not actually in the original Hebrew. If you read the other uh, translations like the New American Standard or the ESV, it, it will say the steps of a man are ordered by the Lord. And it was something that, you know, the the ancient Hebrew translators just assumed that surely God is talking about good people when in fact the truth is the steps of man, good or bad, righteous or evil, the steps of man are ordered by the Lord. He orchestrates it all. God is not just sovereign over the church or the believers. God is sovereign over all of the earth and all of the affairs of men. The steps of a man are ordered, meaning to set up, to establish. Do you realize this morning, your entire life is fixed by God? He has a plan for your life, and it's perfect. And like we've said a hundred times, there's no accidents, there's no mistakes in his plan for you. And sometimes we look at our life and we're not happy with it. And we think, well, I wish this was different. I wish that was different. And we'll talk about that here as we move on. But know this, that your life is fixed by God. Your days are established by Him. And you and I don't know what the future holds. But all of our days are written in His book, as we'll see here in a moment. The steps of man are ordered by the Lord, and He delighteth in His way. And it's ambiguous who that He is, in front of the delighteth. I think it can go both ways. I think God delights in our way, and I think God delights in putting together the perfect plan for our life. He delights in our end being good, and I think at the same time, we need to learn how to delight in His way, because sometimes we grumble and complain. Sometimes we get restless and discontent, but we need to learn how to delight and take pleasure in God's way. Though he fall, and I love this, this one phrase, though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down. That word fall there, it encompasses any kind of fall. It's the kind of fall as if you're attacked by an enemy and he knocks you down. It's the fall like if you fall under the load of circumstances, if a calamity or adversity hits you. It's talking about a moral failure. If you fall and commit sin. If you fall, though he fall, he shall not be what? Utterly cast down. I know in my life, and I'm sure you can testify to the same thing, how many times I've sinned by my own lust and pride and selfishness, and I've been amazed as I've watched God put my life back together bring the pieces all back together, and he didn't make me sin, but he used my sin in a much greater purpose and plan. How many of you have noticed that in your life? So even though you fell, you were not utterly cast down. You may have been cast down for a while because you do reap what you sow, but thank God the Lord upholds us with his hand. And so no matter how you fall, even your fall is in God's hands. And no matter how you fall, even God can bring you through and uphold you in the end. And he can use all things for his good in our life. Psalms 139, verse 16. 
What a great chapter on, on the intimacy of God and how well He knows us and how involved He is in our life. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. Or wouldn't you love to take a peek into that book? God, what's going to happen six months from now? What's going to happen a year from now? What are my children going to look like? What are my grandchildren going to look like? When, when and how am I going to die, Lord? We'd love to flip to the end of that book, wouldn't we? In your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Now see, that should bring you great comfort. Hopefully the pride and the rebellion of man is not rising up in your heart saying, wait a minute, I, I want to be able to control what happens to me. Uh, that's a misnomer. You're, you'll never have that kind of control. God is the one that orders our steps. Our days are written in his book. He ordains what happens. And the circumstances of your life right now are exactly what he wills for you at this moment. All right, so we have that side of the coin, and then when we flip the coin over, we have statements like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That phrase, whosoever believeth, that drives Calvinists crazy. Whosoever? Because they, they, they believe that in sovereignty, God ordains who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. And they believe that each person is predestined to either be saved or lost. How does that work? How can this be true, but those other verses also be true? Well, he says, whosoever believeth, we know that God is willing that none should perish. We see here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So that sounds like you have a, a certain measure of control over what you reap, right? By what you sow. Is that true? Is that a biblical principle? Absolutely. But is it also true that God ordains and is involved in every circumstance of your life? Yes. Simultaneously, both are true. How does it work? One, uh, one thing that might help our understanding, but I don't believe this is the total answer. I, I think the real answer is we need to accept both by faith. But one thing that I think helps our understanding is here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 where he says that we are the elect. Now, elect would speak towards what? Predestination. You know, I, God elects us. I predestine this one to this, and I predestine that person to that. All right? He says that we are elect according to the what? The foreknowledge of God. Okay, oh, okay, so maybe here, maybe I can begin to understand here, uh, you know, it, it's not so much that God is predestinating this one to heaven and this one to hell, but he has foreknowledge. He knows who will accept or reject him. Okay, So we have that ingredient to add into this mix, but yet at the same time, we have to always have the faith to accept both. For those whom he foreknew, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those whom he what? Foreknew, he also predestinated. So it's, it's kind of obvious in the scriptures that God's foreknowledge plays a huge part in his sovereignty and predestination. How it all works, we, don't, we still don't know. We receive it all by faith. But his foreknowledge does give us an ingredient to kind of help us out with the understanding there. I love Acts chapter 15, verse 18. This sermon from James. Known unto God are all his works. From when? From the beginning of the world. You know, when you fell, when you sinned, when you became crushed under that fear, when you became angry or bitter or unforgiving, do you know none of that takes God by surprise? None of what we do, none of what we say, the President of the United States can't even take God by surprise, Rockefeller can't even take God by surprise, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Before creation, 
even was. God knows every heart, every moment of our life. Our days are written in His book. Now let's concentrate on this for a moment before we unhook for this morning. It takes a lifetime to discover and learn contentment in God's sovereign plan. How many of you can say amen to that by your personal experience? It takes a lifetime. You know, it, it's a lifetime of discovering how do I fit in? Where is my place in life? Where is my place in the church? God, how do I fit in to this whole theater of your purposes and plans? Life is spent learning through continual exercise, trial and error where and how we fit into God's plan in this life. And sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong, sometimes we get disgruntled, sometimes we get dis discontent, sometimes we uh, complain and mumble, and then other times we fall back into the peace and the rest of just saying, God, let it be your way. Proverbs 16, verse 9, a man's heart devises his way. We got big plans, don't we? We're going to do this and do that and conquer the world and make a million dollars by the time we're 30. And, right? We got all these plans. And sometimes those plans come to pass. How do those plans come to pass? Only by God's permitting and preordaining. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord does what? Directeth his steps. There are many devices in a man's heart, many designs, many schemes. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. I, I think we can all testify here this morning that our life sure did not turn out the way we thought it would. If you had told me 15, 20 years ago that I would be standing here in this building teaching you all, I wouldn't have thunk it, wouldn't have believed it, would have thought, are you crazy? There are many devices in a man. We think we know what we're doing, and we think we know how things are going to turn out. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. So we have got to be always seeking the will of God, amendable to the will of God, and it is very much a process of trial and error. We put together a plan, a good case in point, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. You know, we, we approached them a couple years ago, and they approached us recently, and we got together with them, and uh, Sal and Rich and I sat down with their leaders, and we went through an hour or so of orientation, and, and uh, they were going to set up a, a meeting with the coaches and get us hooked into Westfields High School, and we still haven't heard back from them. And so that's just a, you know, it, that seemed like a good plan. Right? It was a plan in our heart. It was a way to evangelize inside of the high school right around the corner. We thought it was a good plan. But obviously God has a different idea, at least for now. And the counsel of the Lord is what will stand. And so that's the process of trial and error that I'm talking about. You know, many times we think, well, oh, gee, I'd love to, to have that kind of career, or I'd love to make that much money, or I'd love to live in that kind of a house, or I'd love to do this with my life, or I'd love to have that kind of spouse, and things don't always work out the way we plan. And that's where we surrender to his sovereignty and say, God knows best. And this is where it can get really tough. And I really admire Job in chapter 1. And I think a lot of our life is spent like Job. Listen to what this says in verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone out, the, the feasting of his sons and daughters, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all, his sons and daughters, See, his sons and daughters would have these big feasts. And Job, at the end, at every feast, he would sanctify his sons and daughters and offer up a burnt offering on their behalf. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. You know, maybe they got partying a little too hard and got a little drunk and said some things that they shouldn't have said. Thus did Job, how often? Continually. 
Now, I remember back in the 80s, I remember a couple of faith teachers teaching that Job did this out of fear. You know, that, and then eventually what, what he feared came upon him. And so, I don't think so. I, you know, the more I meditate on the life of Job, I really think Job was doing this in faith. I mean, let me ask you, don't you pray for your children? Don't you pray for your spouse? Don't you pray for them every day? Doesn't your heart break when they make the wrong decisions? Don't you want them so much to follow and serve God with all of their heart? I, th what we experience is no different than what Job is experiencing here. And I think he realized that his children were in the hands of God. And I think he realized that he could, could, not, could not control the lives and the future of his children. And so he was beseeching God, God, take care of them, cover them, protect them. And how many times do we pray? We pray for healing. We pray for more money to cover our bills. We pray for a new or better job. We pray for this. We got, we got a lot of things that we pray for and rightfully so, because God said to come and to make our requests known unto him. So is that wrong? No. Absolutely not. That's what he wants you to do. So we come and we pray, believing to receive the answers to our prayers by the goodness of God. And we always pray that way. But what happens when you pray for healing and someone dies instead? And what happens when you pray for a job and the next thing you know you're have to, having to file bankruptcy? What happens when the prayer doesn't get answered? And this is what Job is experiencing here. He's praying, and by the way, I don't think Job is in your notes because it was a late edition. But here's Job praying for the goodness of God and the protection of God over his children, and then what happens? All of his children are killed. How do you live through that? Can you imagine the pain in Job's heart? And I'm sure he had all of the natural reactions of God, what happened, prayer doesn't work, God didn't listen God, why did you do this to me when I was offering up burnt offerings and praying and interceding for them? What's wrong with you, God, that you would do this to me? I was praying for just the opposite. But what was Job's reaction? And I think this reaction is one of the reasons why God not only defended Job, but boasted in Job. I think God was really proud of Job's heart. He prayed. Job prayed. He offered up burnt offerings, praying for his sons and daughters, and then when the exact opposite happened, look at Job's reaction. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so the question for us this morning is when God doesn't answer your prayer, and when things don't go your way, can you say, blessed be the name of the Lord? Can you worship him, trusting that he has a better plan? And though it may hurt now, he has something better in mind for the end? Because know this, though Job lost his sons and his daughters, God never intended that for Job's destruction. God was going to use that for Job's good. And so when your prayers are not answered and things don't go the way you wanted them to go, you have to have that heart of surrender to God's sovereignty to say, Father, I surrender. This isn't what I wanted. In fact, it's the exact opposite of what I prayed for. But I surrender to your will knowing that you have a better plan. And though it may hurt now, like we were talking about Thursday night, I promise you the rewards and treasures in heaven, by the time you receive those rewards and treasures in heaven, that trial isn't even worthy to be called a trial. Because the joy, the excitement, the thrill, 
of the rewards in heaven so far overshadow the pain of what we experience here on earth. Trust that. Believe it. Know that not God is not trying to destroy you. God is trying to help you. And God is going to use this to build your life in a way far beyond anything you could ever expect. In all of this, Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, you know, we can all say amen to the sovereignty of God until something like this happens. And then we have a real tough choice. Do I trust God? Do I love God? Do I believe He loves me? Am I willing to surrender even this to God? And say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I think the reason why we can do that is if we understand this wisdom in Proverbs 20, verse 24. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Like I shared a few weeks ago, we are looking at life through this little, little people. I mean, this little, tiny people. All we can see is this huge, distorted balloon of a face looking at us through this little people. We can't see what's behind the person. We can't see what's on the side of the person. We've got this one little glimpse, and it's all distorted and bubbled. We have no idea what's going on in life. And we can't fathom why the pain that I'm going through now is necessary. But believe me, if you had a God view and you could see how your circumstance and even your pain fits in to the puzzle here and there and affects this life and affects that life and causes this to happen, and if you could only see how it all fits together, you know what? I'd be willing to bet that you'd be willing to suffer. If you could see the wonder, and the majesty of God's plan, I bet you would be willing to even say, I volunteer for that, Lord, because I see the end product. I see what you're going to do in the end. But through our little peephole, all we see is the pain, and we think, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that, Lord. But remember Jesus, like we shared Thursday night, Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, right? The joy. The joy of pleasing His Father. The joy of being received by Father back into heaven. The joy of accomplishing His Father's will. The joy of you and me being saved. And Jesus looked at you and He said, Dwayne is worth it. Jose is worth it. Dave is worth the cross. I see the final product. I see what my Father is doing. And yes, I would be willing to suffer for them. And so, when we see our goings, and there's a lot of things that we don't like and we grumble and complain about, but if we could understand our way and how the whole plan fits together, we would embrace our sufferings and say, it's good for me to be afflicted. And though I hurt now, God has a plan of how this is going to unfold and affect all of our lives for good. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself. So when you believe in the sovereignty of God, you've got to accept that this morning. My way, whoop, my way is not in myself. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I couldn't put together a life if I tried. I think I could. I think I know what should happen, but I don't. A man's way is not in himself. You don't know how life should be put together. You don't know how all things come together and work for good. Neither is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. We think it is, but it's not. We need God's sovereignty. We need God's plan. We need God's way. And so we have to have a heart. We pray for healing. But then when healing doesn't come, we accept God's sovereignty. God has a better plan. We pray for finance and for prosperity, 
But if it doesn't come, then we accept God's way as being better. We don't understand, but we rejoice in the times when we pray for healing, and healing manifests. And we rejoice in every answered prayer. That's why we boast about them and thank God for them and tell other people how God answered our prayer. And that's the way it should be. But what about, what about those times when it doesn't happen? Can we accept His sovereign wisdom, His sovereign grace to say, Father, You know better. So Father, we come to You this morning and we lift our lives to You and we ask for your forgiveness for the pride of saying, tomorrow I will go here and do this and that. And Father, forgive us for the pride of thinking that we're actually in control of our lives. And Father, we echo the psalmist and we pray, teach us how frail we are. Teach us the end of our days. Teach us that every breath and every heartbeat depends upon you. And Father, we pray for the patience of Job that though he prayed and gave burnt offerings, the exact opposite of what he was praying for happened. And he was willing to accept it and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, that's a hard place to come to. But Father, we ask that you would give us the grace to surrender. And Father, we ask that you would give us the faith to know that your way is better. And we saw Thursday night, Father, how no matter what we have to go through, you always give more than enough grace to endure. And so, in your sovereign will, when you ordain that we suffer, we are never alone in the valley of the shadow of death. You are right there with us. And you never ordain something for us that you don't equip us and enable us to do. And though we can't fathom enduring, your grace will be there available at the very moment that we need it. And so, Lord, because of that, we don't have fears of tomorrow. We don't worry about what the future may bring because we know that whatever we suffer, Your hand will be upon us. And You will not allow us to suffer beyond that which we are able. So, Father, we receive Your sovereignty this morning. And we give our lives into Your hand. And we will continue to pray for good because you are a good father and you love to bestow your blessings upon us. And if the blessings don't come, then that means there's a greater reward laid up for us. And maybe here or maybe in the next life, we will receive the fullness of that reward. And the fullness of that reward will cause our sufferings to be as nothing in comparison. We believe that, Father. And so we have nothing but hope this morning. And we can say that there are no other hands that we want our lives to be in but yours. So we freely surrender and we freely trust and like Job, we freely say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Father, we ask right now that you would go with us this afternoon. Bring us back safely tonight to worship you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.